United States government. It cranks out millions of pieces of paper a day. You couldn't find a better prospect for the paperless office and computers. Indeed, computers are being used increasingly in the political process, especially in that little process called campaigning and getting elected. Today, we're going to take a look at computers and politics on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. AFIPS, along with these constituent societies, brings you the National Computer Conference, NCC 86, offering a showcase of advanced technology and the industry's foremost professional program. For conference information, call 800-NCC-1986. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, what we're looking at on the Mac here is a database service called Washington Alert Service. It's kind of expensive, about 100 bucks an hour, but it has an incredible amount of information about what's going on in the political process in Washington right now. For example, we can find out the exact schedules right now of all the committees in Congress, what's going on on the floor of the Senate or the House. We can check the status of any particular bill that's before Congress right now. We can check the voting records of the members of Congress and of the members of their constituent districts. It seems this is a very good example of how computers are being used to handle the massive data management problem problems involved in the political process, but aren't people also concerned that computers could be used in a, in a dangerous kind of 1984-ish way to threaten the political process? Well, Stuart, this is a clear example of how we're moving into the information age, where information is a valuable commodity. If you have access to, quick and ready access to this information, you have a tremendous competitive advantage. Now, if there's, if the, there's value in, say, the background of a congressman or their constituents, then you can imagine what the value would be of having our own personal records accessible, and how do we keep that from happening? Well, that's a problem. We're going to talk to politicians and pollsters and lobbyists and political consultants today to find out, in fact, how they are using computers in the political process. We're going to begin by taking a look at the use of computers in the California state legislature. At California's state capitol in Sacramento, politics as usual is giving way to automation as usual. At the Senate, in congressmen's offices, at almost every level of legislative life, computers have arrived. In an effort to trim the 500 million pages printed every year for the legislature, the Capitol's data center has established a network of mainframes and PCs to provide instant access to legislative activities. Using unique bill tracking software, representatives can watch the progress of legislation through the Assembly, the Senate, and the myriad committees. The system's new terminals display proposed amendments in the same way as the traditional paper document, but with the advantage of highlighting them in color. As members become accustomed to their new machines, they find their own applications. In this office, letters from constituents are coded and then matched by topic to the bill tracking database. When a controversial bill approaches the crucial vote, warning letters are quickly dispatched to interested voters. While to some critics, a database of choice voters might seem like an open invitation for campaign activities, legislators are eager to point out their genuine need for the system. On average, each office holder has 8,000 bills to watch over and several hundred thousand constituents, each one with an opinion to express. Joining us now in the studio is Roger Lee. Roger is president of Capital Data Communications. Mm -hmm. And next to Roger, Frank Toby, president of Bilo Toby & Associates. Both these gentlemen involved with uh, two of the leading companies in the use of computer technology and politics, mm -hmm. Gary. 
Uh, I'll start with a very general question uh, for Roger. Just how are computers generally being used in, uh, in the political campaigns these days? Well, basically what we do with computers is try to target voters for political campaigns and, and office holders. In other words, we build databases using the registered voter file and then uh, using other files, match it against the voter file to, to pinpoint as much information as we can. What's their occupation? Uh, what's their age? Uh, what's their ethnicity? We might take an ethnic uh, surname dictionary and bounce it against it, or their, their gender in, in a lot of cases. So we're trying to find out as much as we can about that individual voter, if they, how many times they voted in the last five elections, let's say. So it's, it's basically you know, a database problem, trying to figure out how to, what the, what the uh, uh, target audience is and so forth, collecting all that information. Frank, is that basically the same kind of thing that you're doing? That's the beginning. Mm -hmm. The beginning is to develop a d database that you can give the strategist to a campaign, the different segments that make up his district. And then he has to spend the campaign's money to try and develop these segments into people who want to vote for his candidate. And so they use pollsters and other forms of direct contact to try and find out what's going to persuade these different segments. The more that we can identify through the use of the database, the better opportunity the pollster has to try and find segments that we can target. Once that we target them, then we start using different types of products to um, to get our message, to get the campaign's message across. We use direct mail, we use door-to-door -door canvassing, we use phones. You know, there's a lot of campaign products. So really to be competitive in, uh, let's say, in a political uh, campaign right now, you really have to have that information. Is that sort of the way it's... Oh, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think definitely. all politicians know they need it. Now. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Frank, uh, it sounds like a kind of uh, inverse, if not perverse, process in a way where you're saying that the candidate may, in a sense, be transparent. You simply go out and find what the constituent wants, and then that's what the candidate becomes. Not exactly. What you do is you find out the components that make up his district, and then you try and find out the way that the candidate can address each of the different segments within his district. For instance, if you've got a, a, a highly ethnic district, then it's incumbent on the candidate to have something unique to say to the, those ethnic groups. And it might not be the same thing that, would, that a, a, a non-ethnic working guy would pay attention to. So you have to identify them just to get their attention. You know, a lot of people throw campaign mail as they throw junk mail away. And so what you try and do is to find some affinity. And that affinity is uh, determining that they are an ethnic or have an ethnic background, or they're a working man, or they live in a high rent district, or they're, and so on. All the different segments. Now, Roger has, has a product, has a software product mm -hmm. that uh, is, is used apparently in uh, political campaigning. Could you show us what you uh, have here? Sure. Uh, this is Solon, and Solon is a software product for IBM PCs and compatible that, uh, that small campaigns primarily can use, although large campaigns can tie into the mainframe with it as well. And it has really three components to it. The first section is for incumbent office holders, and it allows them to track casework. When someone writes their office or calls their office, you can record where that referral came from, if it came from, maybe referred to the governor's office or something, or it came directly, who you assigned it to in, in your office, and what action you took with that particular uh, you know, constituent's inquiry. The second part is more campaign administration, to candidate scheduling. You can actually schedule multiple campaigns. They'll do all the finance-related uh, types of items, record contributors, who they are, their occupation, their income, I mean, their amount of contribution. Uh, you can also uh, do some polling, set up questionnaires, tabulate the questionnaires, do district analysis, and so forth. How about a demonstration? Sure. Let's take a look uh, at the political office management segment. This actually is installed right now in every assembly office in, in the state of New York. And uh, that's this first one that's up here now. So this would be the, the case management, casework management you were talking that's correct. about? That's correct. That's um, correct. And so a constituent writes to the office, um, and the first thing you'd probably want to do is, is see if, if that individual uh, had written previously. Uh, in this case, let's take uh, John Davis here and take a look at him. What do we know about him? Well, let's see. Obviously, we know his name. We know his address, his phone number. We, we know he goes by a nickname, Jack. Uh, obviously, or probably, he's, he's written in, in this case before because we know quite a bit of information about him. We know he's president of a computer company. Um, and then we also know his date of birth in this case, social security number. We can see that uh, his, his national an uh, ancestry is Italian, is, uh, so he's Caucasian. Where, where do you get all this information? From? Well, it, it just depends. On a case of someone writing the office or having correspondence with the office, you may pick it up from information that they provide to you. In the case of voters, uh, 
we get it from a variety of sources. We may get DMV lists if, if they're available to us. We may take tax assessor lists to see who owns property, who rents, what type of property it is. So it comes from a variety of sources. And what is the, what is your feeling about, this is obviously an issue that, that everybody concerns themselves with, and that's uh, uh, access to what people consider their own private information. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about that? Well, this question really, let's start with Roger. Well, we take, all the lists that we take are, are basically public information. They are public information. And we match them against the, the, uh, the file, as I said, to, to make the, the, the message that, that our clients are sending to the voters more relevant to the, to the recipient. I, we're not prying into anything that's, that's either not public or that is in any way secret, I don't think. Frank, how important is this stuff? I mean, is it possible now that candidate A beats candidate B because he had better software? We have found, and there's some, been some studies made, that campaign tactics account for perhaps as much as two or three percent of the of a vote now most people win by five percent of the vote so fifty percent of the campaigns doesn't have that much of an effect mm -hmm. but the other fifty percent has campaigns. one heck of an effect and so if you have products that really get people's attention and using techniques like this to just find that extra group of people who will give you that attention then yes, you can have an actual effect on an election. Now, Frank, uh, I understand your database, uh, work that you've done with your database is pretty much nationwide. Is that true? We have uh, we have 90 million voters mm -hmm. that we retain, principally in, your database. in the database, principally Democratic. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, we've got to take a break. Thank you very much. We're going to go to Washington in just a minute and see how a congressman uses a computer in his office. First of all, we'll take a look at political polling and see how computers affect political pollsters. Wendy Woods has that report. As politicians have become increasingly dependent on polls, pollsters have become increasingly dependent on computers. Field research, for instance, is filled with a network of terminals connected to a VAX mini-computer. The system draws random phone numbers that operators will call, allows interviewers to read questions right off the terminal, enables them to send those answers directly to the mini-computer. The analysts can then look at the data in a number of ways and compile their reports. We can uh, turn things around much faster now. Uh, when we get the data, it's, it's a matter of uh, two or three days. When we can have tables before, it was probably a week to ten days, something like that. In fact, now with the CRT interviewing, we can uh, turn a study around the minute the interviewing is complete. Over the last few years, computers have virtually taken over the research field. However, one job where computers won't intrude soon is the job of interviewer. Human operators still beat out the synthesized voice. Perhaps the most important aspect of automated research, however, is that the results produced are far more accurate. Field research polls, for instance, claim just a 3.1 percent margin for error in general. And few politicians can argue with that. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. So you used computers and got yourself elected. Next thing you know, you're a congressman here in Washington. What do you do next? Well, in the sports vernacular, you go with the guys, or in this case, the machines, that got you there. In Congressman Bob Carr's case, that means computers. If you look around his office, you'll find four typewriters, seven people, and ten computers. Congressman Carr is one of only three members of the House who has his own computer system, IBM PCs, and an Ethernet network. Congressman Carr says computers have revolutionized the way his staff works. We don't have uh, any secretaries in this office as such. Uh, we require when I hire a person that they have some computer friendliness, that they, uh, it's even better if they have some computer training. Uh, as a result uh, of that and the requirement that they be able to type and they type their own letters, there's, there's no one in this office who uh, asks someone else to do essentially their job for them. They have a computer, it's available, they use it. Congressman Carr uses computers not only to run his office in Washington, but also to get elected back in his district in Michigan. And he thinks better computer systems can make a difference. I've tried to put into my organization, both, both on the official side in, in Congress and in, in, in the campaign, people who are computer smart. And I believe, generally speaking, when it comes to the campaign, we've generally run circles around the opposition. They've made their effort. They've gone down to Radio Shack or wherever and bought their computer and uh, started out from scratch. But we've tried to in institutionalize that knowledge and that, that learning. Um, and uh, 
uh, I think we start way ahead. Congressman Ed Shaw represents the Silicon Valley area of California, so you'd figure he'd use computers, and he does, particularly to handle mailings to voters. Though some people complain about computerized letters, Shaw says it all makes sense. In a campaign, essentially what you're trying to do is get your message out to the voters. Uh, some messages that you have uh, make no difference to the voters. So you're wasting your time and your energy and your money if you're sending that message out to those voters. Another message to those voters could be very influential in their decision making. So the, the use of computers in order to target, if you will, the messages that you send out to those who really care about what you're saying, I think is uh, perfectly appropriate. Congressman Schall sees the day when a computer program could actually design a political campaign. I could envision models, computer models, of exactly how to, to win a campaign based on first your polling data, your historical data, taking that all together in order to form uh, the kind of campaign strategy and themes that will appeal to enough people to get you 50% plus one. But both the congressmen we talked to sent out warnings about carrying computers in politics too far. You always have to keep the technology in its appropriate place. Um, computers can help you assimilate and cross-tabulate vast amounts of data on what people are thinking, and importantly, who, as a profile, are having those thoughts. You still can't computerize the human element. Stuart, now we now have proof positive that computers are user-friendly. We've got a politician using one. Even politicians <laughs> can use them. You're not saying anything I'm just negative kidding. about politicians. I'd like to introduce now Gary, another Gary, Gary Chapman, who has joined us. Gary Chapman is Executive Director of Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, and with us again is Frank Toby. Gary, we'll get to you in just a minute. Frank, first of all, let's take a look at uh, the result of some of the database searches. What kind of materials are actually produced? Well, here's a really interesting one that addressed a particular problem in an Arizona campaign. The pollsters found that senior citizens had the, were going to have the most impact on this health care issue, and yet they were paying the least attention to it. So the campaigner decided that he would design a product, and this looks like a handwritten letter, but it really isn't. It's a mass mailing done in 175,000 quantity, and it looks like it, and it draws people's attentions, and it's addressed only to senior citizens, and it's got uh, something like 1,500 variations on it. But what it did is it, it took the senior citizens and made them read it because it's such an unusual piece. It looks like a handwritten letter. What's inside? Okay, inside is a totally personalized letter. Which is not really personal. Which right? is not personal. I mean, it is personalized on the computer. But written by a computer. But it is lasered. In script. In script on a computer with a matching from the desk of that tells the particular issues that... that we would was like this, the was candidate this to vote successful, on. Uh, yes, campaign. yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, this particular piece had so much impact that there were 20 people whose names were used to write the letters. We got their approval to use it. Mm -hmm. These people received a little over 14,000 telephone calls, and mm -hmm. they, their telephone numbers are not on here. It, telephoning was not requested. So, the, I mean, this is a huge impact. Right. Now, this uh, immediately leads to ethical questions, and this gets to uh, the question I want to talk to you, uh, Gary, about. Um, we have, what, 90 million names now that you've created a database that has apparently all sorts of material about uh, background, ethical backgrounds, uh, ethnic background, and so forth. Uh, what, what do you feel about the ethics of this? Well, first of all, I don't want to... Uh, uh, malign Frank and suggest mm -hmm. that he's doing anything unethical, but I think as a, as a social question this is something that we have to uh, have some sort of public debate about. The idea of actually targeting particular constituencies to address a single issue that they might be concerned about is something that is somewhat disturbing. I think that computers have played a large role in the rise of one-issue politics where people are actually voted into office on their stand on one particular issue and that is a disturbing trend in, in contemporary politics. And what about the gathering of the information? Now, we, we heard that it comes from DMV, for example, farm motor vehicles. Uh, some of that information I might consider myself to be, well, sort of private. Now, how do, how do what about that kind of information? I think that's well, I think that there's, uh, 
there's quite a bit of confusion about that particular issue, about what kind of information should be private and what should be public and so on. Obviously there's some things in tax assessor information and so on that should be public. Uh, there's some information in your driver's license uh, database that might not be made public uh, if you had your preferences. Mm -hmm. What disturbs us about it is that these are things that are collected basically for some particular purpose that the person has agreed to supply that information for and then it's been used for, for another person. purpose which they have absolutely not given their consent uh, to uh, now, Frank, how, is, how do you how do you and your, the companies you work with deal with that particular issue? Well, there's about three levels of dealing with it. First of all, it's a serious problem because by identifying senior citizens in this example, I could use it. A, can, a campaign could misuse it just as mm -hmm. well as properly use it. We needed to get the senior citizens' attention, so this was a way to target them. We did it by matching the voter file against the driver's license file, which was available in Arizona, and that gave us their date of birth. So we were able to identify this group of people. But you could also misuse it. You could write a message to people who weren't senior citizens saying it's time to cut out Social Security. And you could write a contradictory message to, to the seniors saying, I'm all for Social Security. Or in but, fact, if it was used uh, by uh, someone entirely, not even, just take, say, get the database and use it for a purpose of trying to get a contribution to a fund that doesn't even exist. Well, there now, are rules. This, is, this gets back to, right. the, I think, Gary's, uh, Gary's question about the misuse of database. How do you take care of the problem of misuse of the database? Well, there are a couple of basic rules. One is that voter files can only be used for campaign or governmental purposes. So they cannot be used to sell insurance. They can't be used for any commercial purpose whatsoever. That's why my business is 100% political. We can't use the lists for anything else. But the list has value, though. Right? Has the list, list has value, and if it has value, uh, it could be stolen. Um, and if we have, stolen, we have very serious problem. security just for that mm -hmm. purpose because they do have value. So we mm -hmm. try and protect it so that it, it won't be stolen. And even if it was stolen, it wouldn't have any meaning. But there is no mechanism, no formal mechanism in place that really makes that, uh, that protection uh, happen. No. That, that's correct. Gary, mm -hmm. we have just about a minute left. Mm -hmm. And one other issue, the question of using computers now in the actual voting process and the tallying yes. of votes. Some people have expressed concern about centralizing the possible tampering point. Does that bother you? Yes, that's a serious concern, and there's actually several court cases going on in the United States now concerning uh, computer voting, where uh, a particular computer program um, has been uh, uh, accused of being very, very susceptible to fraud and uh, manipulation, yes. In, in what way? Well, in this particular case, it uses uh, data punch cards, and those data punch cards can either be added to the stack of legitimate votes or new data punch cards can be put in that actually change the software code that tallies the votes in the first place. A serious problem. Gentlemen, thank you very much. There's no question computers, like any other tool, can be used for good or they can be used for evil. We're going to get the thoughts of our commentator, George Morrow, on the subject. You know, paper made it easy to record information. The printing press made it easy to duplicate information. And the computer makes it easy to manipulate information. Politics is the art and science of manipulation, manipulating people and events. So you can expect that the computer and the politician are going to go hand in glove. Now lobbyists have manipulated legislatures for a long time. And the politicians are now going to use this computer as a device to try to manipulate you, to try to make you think that things are something that they aren't. Now having a leg up on it is your best defense. And nobody ever told us or promised us that a democracy was going to be easy to run. But a well-informed population, a well-informed electorate, is the best device to keep it running well. Knowing what these computers can and will do is your best defense. That's my opinion. I'm George Morrow. In the Random Access file this week, the Spring Come Deck show in Atlanta is now over. No major news there, about 50,000 attended, including some 700 exhibitors. IBM had the biggest presence with an elaborate IBM theater and a multimedia IBM totem pole. IBM was pushing the theme of connectivity among big blue products. The major no-shows were Apple and Microsoft. Despite all the rumors during the past week, there is at the moment no deal between Steve Wozniak and Nolan Bushnell to merge their two companies. There were stories all over the place that Wozniak's CL9 company and Bushnell's Axelon Inc. would join forces to produce computer-based toys. Both high-tech pioneers say they do intend to work together, but at the moment, no merger. 
In our legislative update file, you may find Congress a little more attentive to the problem of computer crime these days after Congressman Ed Zhao's computer system was broken into by a hacker last week. His entire database consisting of constituent mailing lists and form letters was erased. It's believed to be the first computer break-in on Capitol Hill. Meanwhile, the House Subcommittee on Crime heard testimony this past week about computer crime. Representative William Hughes of New Jersey, sponsor of a computer crime bill, said hackers are no longer teenagers motivated by fun, but professionals motivated by profit. The Hughes bill would make it a felony to maliciously cause damage to a computer program or database. And hacking moved into the video arena last week as Captain Midnight surfaced as the first space hacker. The mysterious intruder broke into HBO's satellite feed with a protest message. FCC investigators say they suspect the transmitter dish was somewhere in Texas. They're studying the characters and color bars used in the transmission in an effort to identify the kind of equipment the hacker used. Time for a software review, and here's Paul Schindler. Does this remind you of a database management system? Of course not. It's a Lotus 123 spreadsheet. And never the twain met until a company called ANSA in Belmont, California, borrowed the spreadsheet idea from Lotus as the basis for their data management program, Paradox. And that's not all they borrowed. Even the command menus look like 123. And a venture capital group, Seven Rosen Partners, helped ANSA get started. The same people helped fund Lotus. Paradox may look like a spreadsheet, but it operates like a fully relational database manager, just like the ever-popular DBase. But unlike DBase, you don't have to learn a complex programming language. Creating files is logical and straightforward. You then enter records or transfer them from your current data management program. Paradox automatically reformats a variety of records from other programs into its internal format. Now, Paradox takes a lot of hardware, at least 512K of memory. And while a hard disk isn't absolutely required, it's a practical necessity. Add to that the $695 price tag, and you'll see I'm talking about a serious investment. But if you need powerful data management, combined with relative ease of use, Paradox is worth it. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Zenith has announced that it's cutting prices on its personal computers. The single drive Z158 goes down $300 to $19.99, and the hard drive AT compatible, the Z200, is being cut by up to $1,000. Zenith may have won the IRS portable contract, but Grid Systems announced this week that it has won a contract to supply portables to the post office. The deal could be worth up to $8 million for 3,000 grid portables. Voice technology moved a giant leap forward as IBM and AT&T made their first appearances at the annual speech tech trade show in New York. Sales of voice products passed the $100 million mark last year. The products shown range from toy bears that speak and listen to office automation systems and industrial systems. And major work is underway by the Air Force to provide speech technology to pilots. The American Electronics Association is trying to do something about the shortage of teachers in the computer field. The AEA has set up a new scholarship program that will provide up to $76,000 for a Ph.D. student if the student agrees to teach for three years after graduation. Finally, a piece of game software zoomed up the charts last week, moving from 15th to 5th on the bestseller list in just one week. It's called F-15 Strike Eagle. It's a flight simulator that lets you pilot an F-15 attack bomber. Among the pre-programmed targets is a terrorist camp in Libya. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. AFIPS, along with these constituent societies, brings you the National Computer Conference, NCC 86, offering a showcase of advanced technology and the industry's foremost professional program. For conference information, call 800-NCC-1986. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard.